Every so often, a game comes around that is absolutely overshadowed by other behemoth AAA titles, never really getting the opportunity to spread its wings and really show the masses what it is made of. Hello friends, my name is Lynn, one half of the team behind Legacy Gaming, and today we are checking out Immortals Phoenix Rising to determine if it's truly worth your time. A little disclaimer about me right up front. In addition to gaming in general, mythology of any sorts is also my absolute jam. Heck, I even took electable courses in college just because I find it so fascinating. The over-the-top stories that reflect the human condition captivate you in an attempt to subtly teach more of philosophy. Any good game centered around mythology should firmly tap into this in addition to the fantastical imagery that comes along with it to really make a lasting impression. Now, what do you get when you take all of that, smash it together with the combat of Darksiders, the comedy and lightheartedness of Spyro, and combine it with a world and traversal system, both straight out of Breath of the Wild? You get, in my opinion, one of the biggest sleeper hits of 2020, and I will explain exactly why. There is no better place to begin than highlighting the world and story that you will be exploring. And by no means is this world or story small. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it is deceptively large. At nearly 50 hours clocked into the game at the time of recording, I've cleared the main story, done a plethora of side quests and puzzles, and I still have a ton left to find and collect. You begin your tale as Phoenix, a simple shipwrecked soldier, who by the end of your journey will be worthy of standing shoulder to shoulder with the legendary heroes of the Greek world. Your entire adventure is narrated, often breaking the fourth wall, by Zeus, the smug, comic relief of the story, and the titan Prometheus, the moral compass as he is known for with his intelligence and for being a champion of humankind. Chained to a rock for giving humans the gift of fire, the two of them bicker back and forth amusingly for the entire story. On the mortal plane before you lies the Golden Isles, land of the gods themselves and sectioned off with areas themed to each of the featured gods in our journey. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, beauty, pleasure, and fertility, resides within the Valley of the Eternal Spring. Lush gardens, vibrant vistas, and an absolutely ornate palace comprises just some of the scenery you will take in here. Athena, the goddess of a whole host of things, most notably war and wisdom, resides in the Grove of Cleos, another lush landscape full of immense palaces, libraries, and glistening statues that'll leave you feeling like you are touring the ancient architecture back in its prime. Of course, where there is Athena, there is Ares, the god of war and its purely destructive capabilities. Violence and brutality is a signature of his, and the war-torn landscape full of ruins, remains, and scorched earth are a sharp contrast to the goddesses around. Last up, we have Ephestos, who has a realm perfectly fitting for the god of craftsmen and fire itself. An absolutely massive forge fueled by towering furnaces, massive aqueducts, and bellows that will send you sky high, all in an attempt to make the fiery forge sing. Zeus even has his own region, an area you will visit much later on in the story called King's Peak. And let me tell you, it is both as regal and unforgiving as the God of Lightning himself. It's truly one of the most breathtaking regions of this map. All of this is centered around the gates of Tartarus, the place where the underworld has infected the Golden Isles through the help of our main antagonist in the story, the Titan Typhon. He's reduced all the gods to a fraction of their former selves and locked their essences away, making it your main objective to retrieve them and restore the gods in an attempt to combat Typhon himself. The entire world is sculpted with most of the great myths from the Greek world in mind. Their stories often incorporated not only narratively, but visually in the landscapes, structures, puzzles, and even creatures themselves. It is abundantly clear that the Ubisoft team not only did their homework on Greek mythology, but they also passionately care about its implementation. Even though in most cases, jokes will come at you from Zeus and Prometheus about these stories as you come across them, they still managed to make the messages these were trying to tell come through. To say the team hit it out of the park narratively in this game would be an understatement of the year. It really is that enjoyable. Now, the reason I find the narrative so important in this game especially is because when it comes to the puzzles, the core progressional activity in this game, at either the start or end of nearly every single one, 
you will be treated to the story portrayed by the elements inside of each challenge. The game really never misses a beat to treat you to a terrible pun or genuine hilarious moment, taking the fabled myths and layering in a bit of humility on the ones who are telling. To say I only laughed at a few of these would be a lie. The fact that these bits of exposition are tailored at the start and end of these challenges is also important because a majority of them are quite difficult and will often require you to focus. Across the world, you will come across various levers, switches, pressure pads, arrow targets, braziers, movable objects, and even lasers. All just possible elements of larger puzzles that will need to be solved to access the loot chests each one has locked away. These loot chests can contain numerous things, from upgrade materials and potion ingredients, to brand new armor and weapons, even sometimes skins for said armor and weapons. In addition to these general puzzles that award physical loot, there are also specialized myth challenges that make up four possible categories and award various levels of Karan coins, essential for you to upgrade and progress your abilities. Navigation challenges will test your proficiency with your skills and traversal mechanics as you race from a starting point to an end location within a limited amount of time. Liar challenges will have you locating small hidden liars that'll play a short sequence of notes that you must memorize in order to play them on the larger liar in that region. Fresco challenges incorporate Greek fresco paintings of famous myths, all jumbled up on four blocks that you must rearrange to form the original painting. And lastly, Odysseus challenges, which will have you controlling arrows of Apollo expertly through the air and various obstacles to ignite a brazier at the very end. All of these challenges, despite having only really four types of these across the entire landscape, never get old because the team each time has found creative ways to hide the elements using other puzzle mechanics to access them. It makes both discovering the puzzle and completing them rewarding, a feeling I can say most other games would only dream to be able to achieve. And finally, we come to vaults. Now these are in a way the unique dungeons of the game that are meant to put everything you know about puzzles, the way your abilities work, and even combat to the test, with some of these taking upwards of a half hour or more to get through. Each vault will be clearly labeled as one of three different difficulty levels, and even notify you if you haven't unlocked the skills required to actually get through it at your current time. Now these vaults feature a variety of final mechanics such as tougher puzzles, combat arenas, and even major boss fights, all resulting in a secret chest hidden somewhere in the level as well, and a bolt of Zeus's lightning at the end to aid in increasing your stamina pool. Now stamina in this game, just like Breath of the Wild, is king. Literally everything you do in this game requires stamina use. Swimming, sprinting, double jumping, climbing, flying, controlling arrows, picking up and throwing objects, even abilities in combat, it all requires stamina. While that may seem tedious, especially starting out, and trust me, Kodiak felt that way when he first tried it, it becomes effortless later on, making your progression actually feel rewarding as Phoenix grows in strength. As I mentioned earlier, Charon coins are essential to acquiring not only new combos for your bow, swords, and heavy axe combo attacks, but they are also key to unlocking and upgrading your godly abilities. The game even further double dips into your abilities by making some of these upgrades needed for more intricate puzzles, like being able to dash through lasers unscathed, or generating a stone copy of yourself to aid in harder, pressure pad puzzles. The uses in and out of combat grow and grow with each upgrade you make and never once does obtaining these resources feel tedious. It's all given to you just by exploring the world as you progress through the game. The one key thing here, however, that does significantly alter how fast you progress is Hermes Heroic Task Board. Doing these basic tasks, which from a quality of life standpoint are also retroactive, will award you with significant upgrade materials for the other portion of progression, Hephaestus' Forge. Here, you will upgrade master categories, including swords, axes, bows, chest armor, head armor, arrow capacity, and even your potion capacity. These upgrade your gear's effectiveness and even unlock passive abilities on those gear pieces as a whole. This means no dealing with leveling up individual weapons or armor through some unnecessary upgrade system that later on might leave you feeling like you regret some of your upgrade choices. This ensures every piece of gear you get can be used in whatever way you want to play your character at whatever time in your journey. It is amazing how beautifully simple this system is, and honestly, the game progresses incredibly smooth just because of it. Not only is every item then viable at any point, but the developers even went so far as to implement transmog, allowing any item, 
be it the item itself or even a variant skin that you collect, to be applied cosmetically to whatever you're wearing. That means no choosing what plays best for you over what you visually like. It's honestly incredible and makes everything you find potentially something that you want to wear and keep. They say half the battle is looking good while doing it. So the last major thing that we really should touch on is the most exciting part of the game, the combat. Now when you first start out with barely anything to your name, you might look at the combat and say, wow, this is really simple. And while I say the combat overall is indeed simple, just like Darksiders, as you unlock more variants on your basic attacks, new combos, new abilities, you will quickly find that the combat gets complex, but in a way that it hands you a ton of tools for the job, and it's up to you in order to figure out how you want to use them. Basic attacks are fast and will deal light damage, rapidly increasing your combo meter, meaning more damage as it gets higher, and it will slowly replenish your stamina, making it a really great sustain tool. Now, heavy attacks, they'll take a bit more time to wind up and land, but will deal significantly more damage, often staggering most enemies, and even build up that enemy's stun meter. It's that little blue bar beneath their health bar that will render them unable to do anything after it breaks for a short period of time, allowing you to get in a lot of hits. Now your bow will give you a ranged option for quick or even guided arrows. With upgrades, you can gain even more damage and even slow time when firing. And finally, your ability. Now let's just say there are some surprises in there that I'd rather let you discover these various uses inside and outside of combat. But they're key to evading attacks, staggering enemies, and dealing with large groups extremely effectively. Some puzzles will even utilize them in uncanny ways, so be on your toes. Never once during combat did I feel like the game was messing me up, despite various combos and abilities sharing a similar key. It just became muscle memory because the game is extremely effective and making you utilize your full kit most of the time in a way that just feels natural. And when I made a mistake, I knew it was 99% of the time my fat fingers that messed it up, and I'm okay with that. And I have to hand it to the developers. While I would love to see more enemy types added to the game to really make encounters feel a bit more, I don't know, hectic, the types they have really synergize well together. And that each fight is often a bit of a puzzle itself, figuring out which enemy is either your biggest threat or which ones can you dispatch quickly to allow you to focus on a harder target. Now I believe I counted correctly when I say there were 13 distinctly different enemy mob types in the game, all with their own variants of difficulty and even boss forms. Now this doesn't include iconic boss fights in the game, those are, those are numerous as well. It's just refreshing to actually feel your progression, not only in your character growing narratively, but also physically in strength. Something a lot of games get wrong, but this one gets oh so right. So there you have it folks, Immortals Phoenix Rising summed up with still a lot of room for your own discovery. I could honestly talk at length about this game, but I don't want to spoil a lot of it for you. It's a fast paced, open world RPG that sees every single one of its core systems elevating it to the next level. But now, if you haven't figured it out, is it worth your time? The answer for me is a resounding yes. So much so is that I would justify this game at full price, something I rarely do. But given that Cyberpunk and other titles may have overshadowed this game's launch, and their forced name change surely didn't help, this team at Ubisoft deserves all the support they can get for this game. I have well over 50 plus hours invested and find complete joy in still booting it back up to go collect all the things I've yet to get. Plus, with what looks to be substantial content coming in the next year of DLC, including an entire new story with a new hero in a new location, this is one to certainly keep your eyes on. I hope this video helped you figure out if Immortals Phoenix Rising is worth your time. And honestly, even at full price, I'd recommend buying and supporting this new IP from Ubisoft. I'd go so far as to even say this is my game of the year. It left that much of an impression on me. If you enjoy this series and you want more worth your time videos like this in your feed, go ahead and hit the thumbs up and consider subscribing to Legacy Gaming. If you choose to pick it up, I'd love to hear what you thought of the game either in the comments below or head on over to our Discord. Our community of over 6,000 members is spread across dozens of fantastic games. So if you're looking for some awesome people to hang out with and stay up to date on all our videos, consider becoming part of the Legacy. My name is Livid, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.